Welcome, everybody. This is Sartre Room with uh, Alex Untap. Thank you guys so much for coming out to this webinar today. We've got a great webinar on creating a technology disaster plan. Um, we will also have a handout here available in the next few minutes that's downloadable. Um, as with all of our webinars, we are recording this webinar so that we can put it up on our YouTube channel. Um, all of our trainings for the past four years are up there, so we've got over a hundred videos. And we've got Joshua uh, Pesquet here who has worked with us on security stuff in the past, and I'm very excited to see this. Uh, this is an update of some stuff that we did about three years ago, and it, this has a very practical focus to it. Thank you all so much for coming out. If you've got any questions, there's two ways to really do questions. One is to type them into the question box, um, and I will be monitoring those and can read them out. Um, there is also a raise hand function, and if you use that, um, we will watch the attendees list, and then we can unmute you and you can ask questions aloud. If you've got a question, there's probably several other people with that same question. Please type it into the box or um, raise hand so that everybody else can uh, hear that and we can answer those questions as we go forward. Uh, thank you so much for coming out, uh, Joshua. Um, good luck with the training. Thank you so much. And thanks again for having me. And thanks to our dealer for putting this training together. And to reiterate what Sart just communicated, please be generous with your questions. Go ahead and type them in to the chat. Go ahead and raise your hand and get unmuted and ask questions. It, uh, we definitely should have time to cover questions over the course of this. And I often find in workshops and trainings, a lot of the best uh, content often comes from the audience in the form of questions and conversations that happen around those. So please don't be shy if, if you have something you're thinking about. So today we're talking about creating a technology disaster plan, and we'll, we'll go a little bit outside the, the narrow confines of, of technology and kind of general incident response and disaster planning. A little bit about me. I'm the Vice President of Technology Strategy at Roundtable Technology. I've also been an Idealware expert trainer for several years. I'm actually now also a faculty for N10's Technology Certificate Program. And basically, I've been spending the last 20 plus years in New York City, working with literally over a thousand different nonprofit organizations helping in a variety of technology frameworks and Roundtable serves currently about 300 different organizations as an outsourced IT, technology strategy, cybersecurity, website developer, all that great stuff. If you don't know about Idealware, Idealware, of course, helps nonprofits make smart decisions about technology. They do that through reports, which are very well researched, different articles, reviews of software, guides, very comprehensive guides. Uh, they just released one, uh, an annual one that they do on constituent relationship management software. And of course, they also offer trainings like the one you are attending right now. What we're gonna cover today, scenario planning. What could happen? Thinking about all those bad things that happen and Kind of learning to be unafraid to think about those things. I think people don't want to think about bad things and then they're not prepared for them. So I'm going to encourage you to go ahead and think about those bad things without worrying about them. Just thinking, hey, what will we do if that happens? We're going to talk about basic four scenarios, thinking about, you know, the initial response, like someone kind of saying, hey, we're having an emergency. <laughs> let's, let's, let's invoke our, our disaster plan and, and officially say that's starting. We're going to talk about reviewing your systems, talk about the priority and order of getting things back online and functioning and other planning configurations. That's the basic outline for today. And again, we've got 90 minutes allotted. I think we'll comfortably be with inside that. So I really do encourage questions for everybody. And by the way, in case anyone's curious, I'm speaking to you from New York City. I'm six floors up in Queens and I am on a fairly busy street. So if you hear sirens or things going by, I apologize, there's uh, not much I can do about it beyond what I've already done in terms of closing the windows and putting on the noise canceling headphones. But if you hear siren noise in the background, don't be afraid, I'm not uh, having my own disaster. <laughs> At least hopefully I am uh, doing things. And so we're gonna go ahead and launch our first poll. I think Sarth, I will, I will need you for these polls. And we're gonna ask, have you ever 
worked at an organization that suffered a significant data loss or destruction to the office? Um, there, we've got about 50-50 so far. Um, okay. Oh, I'm not yeah. seeing those, sorry. So I apologize. I guess I'm only going to see the questions that you share with me as the presenter. Sorry, I'm used to being uh, in a No problem. And I will upgrade you to an organizer just to see if that gives you the additional access. Oh, that'll probably do that. It should be fine. Um, bear, bear with us for a moment. If it disrupts the screenshots, that's fine. And OK. So yeah, and, and right after I took over LSN Top, um, we lost almost everything with our previous uh, hosting company. Um, they had no backups, and we had to go through the process of switching hosting companies, um, going with an entire different system, um, and we have since had to use those backups twice in the last five years to recover things from the site. So it is very, very practical to us, um, very, very useful. Yeah, and these you know fall into the categories of things that no one thinks about too much until the moment you need it. And then I think for anyone who's in the IT field or, or who really needs significant data, I think all of us can relate. And I know I've had this multiple times in my career where suddenly an executive director or a CFO calls you and says, I just realized we lost, you know, or accidentally deleted our entire budget for Q3. I need you to restore yesterday's version ASAP. And in my own head, I'm immediately thinking, oh boy, I've been getting these backup notifications for the past six months, but I haven't actually, you know, done a test restore. I'm not sure I remember exactly how to do that. Gosh, I hope it works. I hope these backups are in good shape and, you know, the heart palpitations and everything are happening. And that's not a feeling that you have to have in that scenario if you, you do a reasonable amount of planning. It also doesn't have to become your whole life to do it. All right, so there are so many different kinds of disasters. And the first point that I want to make to everybody is attending today is to not try to anticipate every possible thing that could happen. A, that's not possible in any practical sense, and B, uh, most of the different bad things that can happen still have a limited number of ways in which they impact you. And we're actually going to give you some kind of different scenarios to help you kind of reveal the different problems that different kinds of disasters may, may produce. And so I encourage you not to, you know, get overly concerned about. So, and we're going to go through some of the kinds of natural disasters here. So first of all, is a flood, and what happens if if water comes in? If you're a ground floor or a basement, if one thing that uh, don't think about this will come up with another slide, but fires often uh, more of the damage is done from water from the fire department in fires than is actually done by the fire, and floods can happen because of a fire. So even if you're many floors up, you still may want to think about, well, what happens if the sprinklers for the building got engaged? What happens if, you know, people put a bunch of water in here? The floods is one thing to think about. Earthquakes, and these are things where you, you may have power outages, you may have fires, you may have disrupted access to your office, you may have people stuck in the office and unable to leave, and there's lots of different kinds of scenarios. Obviously here in New York following 9-11 and then again following Hurricane Sandy, it, New York I think overall does a pretty excellent job as a city and organizations within the city overall do a pretty good job because we've had some pretty significant things that have really tested our disaster planning and caused organizations to really think hard about what to do in these scenarios. But think about that kind of thing, and then you can think about in tornadoes, what if things get picked up, and you can kind of keep going through this and, and make yourself a little crazy. So you have like fires, tornadoes, you know, earthquakes, you know, what about tsunamis, what about, you know, da da da. And then of course, then there's hacking, and then we could also think about in terms of cyber security, just flat out deletion of data, failure of hard drives, employees stealing stuff, you know, theft of, of systems within the organization, all these different kinds of things that can result in disasters or significant incidents that you need to have some kind of response for. And ransomware is another one. This has happened to lots of organizations and this is where backups can, can obviously 
you know, play a huge factor, but also thinking about time and how long your downtime will be and things like that. And rather than, well, let's go to this poll first. So let's have people type in, having, having gone through these, and I'm deliberately not spending a lot of time here because I'm gonna spend more time on, on what's coming up. But I'm curious if people can enter into the chat again for me, what kinds of disasters you're most worried about for your organization? And I'm gonna delete the stuff that's here already just to clear the path for, for what people are most worried about. So go ahead and put in what you're most worried about. So we've got a hacking ransomware, hacking, hacking's high on the list for folks, very much in the news. So hacking and staff errors is one. Thank you everybody for putting these in, by the way. Hurricanes and hacking, so we've probably got someone who's living in hurricane stuff. We've got someone who's concerned about earthquakes and hacking and staff errors. Uh, so a lot of a lot of focus definitely on on hacking, less so much on natural disasters seems to be the real concern. So I will certainly not give short shrift to the natural disaster concerns, but clearly there's uh, much more consistent concerns around hacking and cybersecurity concerns than the other things. So I'll make sure that we give ample time for that. And thank you all for for doing that. So rather than think about each of these different kinds of things, there's some broader scenarios that I encourage people to think about in terms of disaster planning. And, and these won't cover the cybersecurity piece, but they will, actually, I'm sorry, one of these will. Um, but they'll give you, if, if you do these as kind of thought experiments, ideally with executive staff within your organization who can give clear responses as to what's truly important and what's truly not within the organization, these scenarios will help you cover most of the kinds of things that happen. And uh, Brian, I'm, I'm, I don't imagine that you've seen these or maybe you've re reviewed the deck, but I'm curious as to your feedback on these as well. And I, I've used these when I do strategic tech planning with organizations and we get to our incident response. These are the scenarios that I, I'll literally have folks walk through and I'll talk to the executive directors and just say, I just want to spend 10 minutes on each of these and I want you to really think about this and think about what would happen. So the first one is, it's not intuitive at all, but just take all the, all the technology out of your office, all the computers, all the servers, all the network equipment, everything, and replace it with brand new stuff. So you leave the office one night, you come back in the next morning, and you know we could say this is good news. All of your old seven-year-old computers are replaced with brand new ones. Your old servers are replaced with new ones. You have a brand new firewall, brand new switches, brand new everything. And the question, then is what, what does our recovery path look like to actually being operational from that point? We've got internet, we've got all brand new equipment, everything's fabulous, but we're going to need someone to get it all working for us, you know, get it connected to the internet and networked. And then we're going to need someone to recover the data and sort of get it operational again. And this little thought exercise helps you understand what your recovery time is really going to look like and also what information would be lost in that scenario. So if you say to yourself, oh my God, you know, all of our backup tapes were actually in the office. So if you're telling me that someone came in and replaced all of our existing backup tapes with old backup tapes, that we'd have lost all of our organizational information for the history of time. Well, you've just revealed a pretty, in my view, significant you know, risk of your existing environment, right? That, that you don't have any kind of offsite recovery cap capability. And this scenario I find is a really useful one as a kind of starting point to, to think about. And it also helps you understand another thing that I find really often, and especially with executives, not to, not to pick on executives, it's just a misunderstanding. If executives, for those of you here who are IT folks, this is really important. Executives often, equate a backup, the phrase backup, with high availability. And for those of us that are IT folks, we know those are very different things. That I could have, if I have, let's say, a file server with a terabyte of, of data that is serving files with permission sets and all this good stuff to 50 different people, and that file server suffers a catastrophic hardware failure, and I don't have any other server to which I can restore this terabyte of data and my backup is in the cloud and may take you know three days to download a terabyte of data and then I'm going to have to figure out a way to acquire another 
piece of hardware on which I can mount a terabyte of data and share it out with decent performance and perhaps even you know recreate all the shares and remap them. It might be three or four days of downtime. And what I find is executives don't understand that. They're like, well, we have a backup. Why can't it just turn on? And it's really important to communicate that and the difference between those two things to, to executives so they understand. The next yeah, scenario, uh, go ahead, Brian. Because it emphasizes the need to have that backup in a second location and then also practically run through once every year or two years going through that process and seeing does it work, how does it work, what is the downtime, is that acceptable, do we need to redesign this to change that. And if you do that proactively before there's a problem, when a problem comes up, it's so much easier to recover. Yep. And and IT people, it's really easy to make assumptions that won't be in alignment with your executives. And I've, I've made this mistake at my peril and, and learned from it, where I've assumed that they don't want to pay $1,000 a month for a high availability solution when they're paying $50 a month for crash plan right now and been dead wrong about that. And when I explained to executive director, like in our current scenario, this system, this you know, your financial and donation management system is going to be down for three or four business days. If we suffer a hardware failure, they've said, what's the cost to make that not true? I've said, oh, that's a thousand dollars a month. They said, let's do that. That's a no brainer for me. So don't make assumptions about that. You know, the cost is going to be prohibitive. All right. Second one is the power. Just take the power out for a couple of weeks and figure out what's, going to work at your organization and what's not. One of the scenarios we'll look at later, actually, that happened and, and they made some changes based on that. And I, following Hurricane Sandy, you know, my running joke, I don't know if the joke is right, but I, I've been a big advocate for cloud services ever since Gmail and Google Docs came online and then Office 365 and then they started donating it to nonprofits. You know, going back even 10 years, I've been a real big advocate encouraging organizations to move away from in-house infrastructure to cloud services and really getting not a lot of traction with that as nonprofits were fairly comfortable where they were and were somewhat suspicious of the cloud. And Hurricane Sandy really was, and I don't mean to be glib about Hurricane Sandy, but it was in many ways the best marketing for cloud services here in New York City that, that could have been produced because the amount of migration to cloud after that was profound as people realized, oh yeah, that's why cloud services are really helpful because when the people that couldn't go into their offices for two weeks but were using Salesforce and Google Apps, now G Suite, they were like, okay, well, I'll just work from home or work from this other office that someone's loaning us for the week and we're all fine. Uh, and that, that's a real powerful thing. So take the power out for a couple of weeks. Think about, well, what systems are we going to have to go in and pick up a server and carry it to some other location and power it on? If so, do we have a plan for that? Do we know how we're going to get there? What if we can't physically get to the office? Do we have any way to get that data if we're denied access to the building because it's, it's in a disaster or something like that? So that's another scenario I find very helpful to shut the power out. Next one, uh, the, the classic one is hit by the bus. I think people have decided that's me, and so now the one is they win the lottery and they move to Aruba and they never return our calls again. But just go ahead and take some senior staff out of the picture. They leave unexpectedly. You can't talk to them anymore. You can't get any information from them. What, what, what have we lost and, and how much disruption is there in terms of institutional knowledge? about different things. There's a lot of organizations that are at massive risk of this with internal IT staff, where there's not good documentation. They're the only person that knows the passwords for things. No one else would be able to get into it. And it would be really problematic if that person was unavailable to the organization. This is something just, just experientially over the last 20 years happens less than the first two. The first two scenarios are more common, at least in some portion than this scenario, but this scenario does happen and it's certainly worth spending a little bit of time to think about what redundancies you do or don't have. Brian, do you have anything on these last two before uh, I move on? First few months of taking over LSNTAP, it was a matter of interviewing past staff and finding passwords and creating lists of resources and 
who controlled the domain name and all that type of stuff. If those individuals um, had died and they were not around, a whole swath of access would have been lost entirely. Just creating those best practices to keep those lists accessible, available to other members of the staff, that type of stuff can save you hours or even months of work um, if there is an issue. And to add to that, I would say the a really common thing that I do see and I mean at least several times a year, is some business critical service, and the most common one that people can think of is your domain registration. So lsntap.org is registered to Brian, and Brian leaves LSNTAP and is gone for three years, and the domain starts to expire, and all of the notification messages from Network Solutions are going to Brian at lsntap.org, Brian, of course, isn't responding. That email isn't there. It's getting auto replies. And the next thing you know, the website's down, the email's down, everybody's totally confused. And it turns out that the domain has expired because no one was getting those notifications. And that can happen for other business critical things like SSL certificates, website hosting contracts, phone vendor contracts, all kinds of things. And where you register these things, try wherever possible to use distribution lists that are role-based as opposed to actual individuals. And if you are inheriting an environment, going through and getting all those set up is, is a really nice proactive thing to do. Yeah, we, we had a program both lose a YouTube channel because it was registered to an individual's personal um, Gmail and a domain name all within the past six months. I mean, these are very practical pieces of uh, advice here. Yeah, yeah, and that, and that, I just want to tell everybody that is such a common thing that I see, and and it's just, you know, it's just, it's a little bit of work to go do it. It takes maybe, you know, 15, 20 minutes for you. Okay, what's that account worth? But it 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 saves you so much headache in the future. And boy, I'll tell you, there's nothing worse than having. And I, by the way, I've seen it where sometimes the, the domain expires and then someone else snatches it up. But now you're buying it back from someone who's very opportunistic. That happens less than it used to, but still there. All right, so scenario four. So we got scenario one is we have all new technology. Yay. <laughs> what data did we lose, right? We, all our technology is just taken from the office, every computer, backup tape, uh, laptop, you know, phone, everything taken, replaced with brand new stuff. What does that look like? Uh, second scenario, turn off the power for two weeks. Third scenario, get rid of some key staff. They, they just leave and they don't talk to us anymore. And then the fourth scenario, now we're getting into cybersecurity. And this is just imagine that some sensitive information is breached. So let's say your you know, Salesforce database with all the donor information, social security numbers, and contact information is breached. Bunch of questions here. How are you going to know that that's happened? Do you have any kind of system of breach notification that would possibly help you with that? And then do you have any kind of communications plan? Do you have a template written up of something that you would communicate that would do this really clearly. This this is a wonderful thing. There's wonderful examples out there of a appropriate breach notification that is communicated because this is something that pretty much every major company has either already had to deal with multiple times or is going to have to deal with. And there's a bunch, you know, a checklist of things to communicate to your customers or your constituents or your staff to say, you know, here's what we know, here's what we don't know, here's you know what's happened, here's what we've done so far to try to remediate it, here's what we're going to continue to do, here's what, if any action, you should take as our as our donor or as our constituent. And you know, if you have questions, here's the thing. And there's if you do this well, it doesn't it doesn't have to result in reputational damage for your organization and in some cases it can even enhance it you know i i've been approached by organizations where they had a breach and i said look the way they handled this everything and that it only speaks more highly of them like the fact that they got breached does not speak poorly of them by itself because anybody can get breached and brian and i've done security things and you know that's that's clear but how you respond to that that's very different so ha there's a lot of prep you can do there to, to just have yourself in a and a better response. So those four scenarios, I think, are really nice things to just run through and, and will cover a lot of the kinds of other ranges of things 
uh, from a technology perspective. Again, we're not that, that's not going to cover all the human concerns around different disasters, but that's that's a bit outside of technology. But I think that those four kind of thought exercises really cover an enormous amount of ground in the in the disaster planning area. Right, and having policies in place that control what information you actually store and then when you destroy information. We've done a bunch of stuff recently on data destruction policies for NTAP. Um, help limit both your liability and the possible harm when it comes to those type of breaches. Um, they, they will eventually happen and not having the, the sensitive information unless it's absolutely needed is going to help significantly in those cases. Yeah. And Brian, I, I don't want to get too far afield, but I actually just completed a project here in New York City for a, a civil rights organization that had very significant government subpoena concerns. And they actually asked me to, to, to sign something where I would say I wouldn't give up information if subpoenaed by the government, then I would, to which I had to say, I'm not, you know, I can't, can't sign that. I'm not going to go to jail on behalf of your organization, but I'd be happy to work with you. But we, so we had to set up a very clear compartmentalization structure where sensitive information that covered certain areas has never touched the round tables environment ever. So uh, certain things to review, I just did it within their office, looked at it only within their office and on their machines and never put it on anything. So I can legitimately say if a subpoena comes to me, I don't have any of the information that you're asking for. Like, yeah, I looked at it, but I don't remember what any of it says, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and not having information that is sensitive that you don't need to have for business purposes is in many ways kind of rule number one of cybersecurity, right? The, the easiest way to protect the information is to not have it in the first place if you're worried about it being breached. So that's an excellent point. Right. So same thing is true with e even internal employees. Create a system to where you are only giving them access to things that they essentially need. Um, that way, if their information, their password is is compromised, their only your only uh, loss of information is uh, limited significantly. Yeah. And as a, in the cybersecurity area, I don't know if it's like intelligence cybersecurity, but principle of least privilege or PL, PLP, which is just, you know, that you operate from the realm of people only have access to things when they have a business purpose to have access to it. And then they have the least amount of access that they only need read only, they only get read only, you know, so on and so forth. As we think about our first response, all right, first things first, we wanna make sure that our personnel and our constituents and everybody is safe. And I think it's really important to understand that while there's obviously technology needs that go on, people's personal safety comes first. And I do wanna be clear, having been in a number of disasters, this is something that is easy to lose sight of when you know the proverbial uh, stuff is hitting the fan. And I encourage people to make it explicit in your disaster planning that, that the understanding is that we're not asking staff to risk their life, you know, to protect organizational information. That, that personal safety of employees is paramount. Unless, you know, you're in an organization where, where mission-wise, that's, that's inconsistent with your mission, where, where you're doing work where it's understood that you're potentially putting your life in danger in order to serve the people that you need to serve. But I would say for the vast majority of us, especially in legal services, you know, you shouldn't be risking your life uh, or putting yourself in personal danger during a disaster, especially to perform some kind of a technology or recovery role. Also just having an idea of, you know, how are we gonna, how are we gonna verify the, the safety and contact of everybody? How are we going to know? This was uh, after 9-11 here in New York. This was a real challenge and really, you know, petrified a lot of different organizations. I worked at that time for an organization that was not, you know, within blocks of, of World Trade Center, but was about a half a mile away. And, you know, there were staff that were not there that day. It was very difficult to communicate. A lot of the digital infrastructure was down uh, and, and it was hard to verify the safety of people as we were going through and that, and we spent, wind up spending a lot of effort 
you know, probably two days before we were actually able to verify that all about 45 of our staff were okay and, you know, were in a place where they were, you know, able to be safe. And then we started working through, well, who's online and can communicate, who has a phone, who has email. Uh, these are some kind of basic things that it's worth sort of figuring out um, as quickly. So you can kind of have a, a dashboard to know who's, who's available, who's not. Another thing that's not obvious is declaring that something's going on. So if you put together this plan that says, okay, we've got this team, here's what we're gonna do, here's the steps we're gonna take, someone needs to declare we're doing this. This is now everybody who's on this team, who's on our incident response team, this is now your, your job until we declare we're back to a normal state or we're resuming some level of normal functioning. And again, I really encourage organizations to make this explicit and, and have a, a little conversation ahead of time where everybody understands that. Like if, if there's a five person team that involves our IT director and our HR person and a communications person and our executive director and say, okay, these people are on our incident response team, then when if we declare an incident, if the executive director says, okay, this is an emergency, then that's everybody's job until the executive director says we are now resuming some form of normal operations and now your jobs are shifting again. And that's important. Understanding how you're gonna communicate if the office is down, especially if you have like internal email systems, internal phone systems, if, if your communications infrastructure is going to be down in, in one of these scenarios, like your power, then understand how you're gonna communicate with people after that. And this is where people make these mistakes if they have personnel files that are all digital in the server that then can't be accessed. So we're down, we don't have email, we don't have phones. The emergency numbers for everybody is on the file server that's also down, so now we can't get people's home numbers or emails, and now we're just scrambling and trying to get all this on the fly, which is obviously not an optimal way to do that. Having emergency contact trees and directories that are stored outside of your normal system so that they can be accessed in the event of an emergency, really important. With the cloud world, this gets a lot easier, but I've, I've seen that mistake made a fair amount. Defining roles, having roles, having backups for those roles, who's responsible for communicating with the staff, who's responsible for recovering the systems, who's responsible for uh, you know, communicating with external parties, with donors, who's responsible for updating the website to let us know. There's a lot of different things that need to happen. And even for, for minor stuff, just to give everybody a little perspective, we changed a workflow at Roundtable about a year ago where when we have emergency, so we do emer you know support tickets, we run a help desk and we provide support to about 300 different organizations. And when we have emergency tickets come in, like a network down and it's, you know there's a, some kind of hairy work that has to be done on the firewall or someone's you know suffering a DOS attack and we're having to, to figure out how to deflect that. You know, our engineers are really you know, heads down, feverishly working on the problem. And in the meanwhile, there's some executive director who's asking for status updates. And we learned that it was completely unreasonable to ask the senior engineer to be putting together coherent uh, communications to executive directors or CFOs of organizations about the status of this emergency. And we started assigning project managers to emergency tickets or you know, to, to system down tickets, whose role is simply communication. So they just talk to them with the engineer and bother them for 30 seconds and say, I just need to know a couple of basic things, just answer that for me and then I'll take it from there. And then the PM is responsible for communicating. That's really important because you don't want someone who's dealing with an emergency to have to take time out to think about communications. You want someone who's dedicated to just the communications role and thinking about all those different roles. Brian, you have anything you want to chat, chime in on here? Is Long. No, I, I think that the defining rule, roles is important, and once again, um, actually practicing these things, especially when it comes to the previous point about um, checking in on staff, making sure everyone is safe, like set up once a year, or once every two years, actually going through a scenario, writing it up, and practicing it with staff so that you can figure out whether what you put together in theory works. 
And and I think the, the great balance this will come up multiple times is, you know, how much time do we spend in disaster planning versus we all have work to do, right? And disaster planning is sort of risk mitigation. It's very unsexy. It doesn't improve anybody's life unless this really bad thing hap- this happens and then it has a potentially huge impact. And these things are always very hard to determine how much effort to put in. And I encourage you not to go crazy with the amount of effort. This is not something you'd be spending weeks on. But as Brian, I think, keeps mentioning, I think as a once a year something you maybe take a day and just run through these scenarios with folks, look at the plan that you have. If you don't have a plan, you'll have to spend a little bit more time than that to develop an initial plan. But once you've got that, it's really just a matter of updating it once a year. And that's sufficient. But do it. Do update it once a year. A few typical roles. Executive director is the one who's going to declare the emergency, who's going to make, you know, set priorities. They're obviously, you know, the person who's calling the shots. You've got the IT director who's going to, you know, take care of the technology things. You've got operations who's dealing with the building and dealing with facilities. You've got HR who's dealing with the staff. You've got a program in terms of services and then communications who is communicating with everybody. Those are a pretty good breakdown of the different roles that you may need. And depending, again, on your organization, you may not need all of these things or you may need more. But it's important to understand the different functions that will need to be happening during emergency and making sure that you have appropriate personnel assigned to them and that they're not overburdened with the things that they'll be needing to do. As Brian mentioned, keep a directory. This should you know, have all of the emergency contact information for staff, the personal contact information, their personal mobiles, personal emails, so that if you have organizational systems that are down, you'll still be able to communicate. Again, with cloud services, if you're fully cloud-based, then you sh- those systems should continue to operate in the event of an emergency, and, and that, that makes life a lot easier. Um, this is not, by the way, the time to realize that you actually don't know who your phone vendor is or who your website provider is or how to update your website or who your internet service provider is or who your building manager is. These are all things you want to have contact information for all of those and have some kind of relationship with them. Just, you know, have actually called them and verified that they'll actually answer the phone at that number and, and things like that. And that's a that's a task that can be done as part of this is just someone actually, you know, calling those numbers, emailing, saying, hey, is this still the right contact if we need help with this or, you know, this other thing. Keeping those directories updated. Establishing a meeting place. This is, you know, kind of you know, disaster planning 101 for families and for businesses. If we have to leave our home because of a fire, if we have to leave our office because of a fire, if there's an earthquake and our, no one can go to the office, then where will people meet? Uh, do we have an alter, alternative meeting place that can function as an office? And what's the level of functionality we have there. If, if you're just looking for a place to meet, it can be in many places a public place that's within some distance of your office. Uh, if you actually need an alternative working space, then obviously that has much more stringent requirements for what you'll need. You'll need desks, you'll need internet access, you'll need computers, you'll need all of that kind of stuff. And, you know, obviously, a backup for that. So if your meeting place was three blocks away and the disaster is an earthquake that shuts down a whole city, then you need some other plan for that. And this is where I, I don't encourage people to get too nuts about this stuff in terms of, you know, having like some sort of offsite facility in another state where you're going to go meet, but at least kind of say, well, what are we going to do? And the default stance for most organizations is people are going to work from home, uh, which is, I think, okay. But again, it depends on the functionality of your organization. We're going to get to that as we, uh, as we proceed here. And just as a reminder for people, under the handout section, there is both a copy of these slides and there is a a two-page little takeaway that covers all four of those uh, scenarios and then all 20-plus questions that we're asking here in a quick checklist. So I recommend people uh, download that checklist and use that, share that. It's under an open license. Uh, Please customize it, make it practical for you also. And then kind of basic needs for folks, which is, you know, food, shelter, movement. A big one that happened after 9-11, I'll tell you a big change that happened in New York after 9-11, which is pretty much every female employee at every office in New York City keeps a pair of old tennis shoes under their desk. 
because people who had to walk 100 blocks uptown quickly to escape dust in high heels uh, were really, you know, kind of like that, that was a disaster. And, and that's just a really small, easy thing to do that can actually turn out to make a big difference if you have to run or if you have to walk a long way or may not be able to get to another pair of shoes in, in some period of time. That's a super cheap, easy thing. And guys can do that too, obviously, but guys' dress shoes tend to be you know, reasonable for, for long walks or, or mild runs. Other things like water, food, flashlights, there's a lot of pretty basic stuff that's easy to have on hand and inexpensive to have on hand that can turn out to be really handy if, if you have some kind of power outage. So just dealing with that kind of basic stuff. And again, this is not technology stuff at all, but just, just basic. So just having little, you know, a bag that people have in their desk with a bottle of water and a granola bar and a cheap LED flashlight and a pair of shoes, you know, that, that's certainly not a bad idea to have. All right, we'll ask people to put this into the chat again. How confident are you uh, that you'll be able to reach everyone associated with your nonprofit in the event that you, that you have an emergency? Are you very confident? Are you not confident? Are you very unconfident? So we'll ask people to put in there. So you can put a, yeah, go ahead and put a C for confident. You could put a, a V for very confident, N for not confident. Let's see if we have people, or people are just putting the letters for there. Yeah, that's good. Oh, you guys are so smart. You're putting the letters for the thing. Yeah, yeah. So, see, not very confident. Not so. People are not. Kind of a single A here. No one's saying very confident. So everybody's somewhere in the middle there, and that's an indication that there might be some work to do to make sure that you, you know, can get in touch with everybody in the event of an emergency. And again, think about the different parties, the different vendors, the different facilities, people. This. You know, in the middle of a disaster is not the time to start forming a relationship with a critical vendor that you have. It's much better to have that relationship ahead of time. All right, thank you everybody. All right, so we're gonna go into review your systems. And this is where we're gonna start thinking about the, the level of, you know, the acceptable levels of risks for organizations and how this can vary a lot. And this is really where, in my view, a lot of the time that you're spending around disaster planning should be focused on, is in conversations with different stakeholders within your organization to try to understand what are the priorities of this organization in different scenarios and what's acceptable levels of risk for us. The backups versus high availability, the $50 a month backups versus the $1,000 a month high availability solution, and the acceptable level of risk against those costs are important kinds of conversations to have before you're in the scenario and your executive is deeply unhappy with the risk that they didn't realize they had assumed. And, and that's, you know, for all of you who aren't executive directors who are on this or aren't in, in executive roles, that's, I, I can't emphasize that strongly enough to really try to have those conversations ahead of time. We take an example and not to, in any way disparage the importance or diminish the importance of community theater to a civil society. But if there is a, a disaster and you're a community theater, it's probably not critical that your operations continue uh, you know, that day or that week. It's, it's probably gonna be okay if, if you guys aren't able to send out your, you know, uh, event notice for the month of July, uh, this Friday, if it turns out there's some major natural disaster in your area and your, your theater's off. So that, that's one. On the other hand, if you are a domestic violence shelter and you're taking in victims of domestic violence and their children, uh, or children who are you know, victims of, of, then your services may be even more critical you know, and certainly no less critical. And your ability to perform the various functions that your organization are still just as necessary in the event of a disaster in a very different kind of scenario than the community theater. And obviously there are thousands and thousands of different kinds of organizations. So thinking about for your organization, when 
stuff starts happening, what, what do we need to be able to do? Who's depending on us? How much are they depending on us? And what's our ability to do that with different, you know, in these different kinds of scenarios that we've, that we've thought about? So we'll throw another poll here in here. How important is it that your organization continues providing some of your critical services during a disaster? So if you give a one here, you're saying, hey, we could close for a few days, our whole business could close, and everything would be fine. So if I take Roundtable as an example, right, we're, we're probably, I'm not going to put us at five, but I'm going to go ahead and say we're probably at a three and a half or a four in the sense that, again, 300 different organizations count on us for their IT support and, and need us in order for themselves to be functional. And some of those organizations are, in fact, domestic violence shelters and other organizations that, that provide much more critical services than we do, but they're dependent on us for their information system. So for us, we, you know, if there's a natural disaster in New York or in Maine where we have operations, we, we pretty much need to keep functioning, at least on some level. We couldn't close for a few days and everything would be fine. But, but some of you are probably are in that scenario. And most of you are kind of in the lower, I don't see anybody putting higher than a three here, so that's good. That, that makes a more relaxed kind of situation for you in terms of your, your disaster recovery. Think about your essential functions. You rank the activities of, of your organization. A lot of time, something like payroll is really high, making sure that payroll gets processed is, is a very high function, making sure that you know all the vendors get paid and, and things like that, basic functions. A lot of times people think of email as a critical service. A lot of times it maybe is, maybe isn't. Again, you know, if you're domestic violence, if you're providing legal services to people in crisis, then some of those services may be the most essential, um, some of them are less. Again, when I have these conversations with executive directors, it's I've never not been pretty surprised by what they said were the critical services. And, and again, my assumptions from an IT perspective have been pretty consistently wrong about what, <laughs> what I saw were the critical services and then what the executives in the organization said. All I really care about is like this folder and this application. Like I, all I really care about is our financial application and our HR folder. I don't care about anything else in our systems. I don't care about email. I don't care about the whole rest of our document management. Like as long as those two things are able to function, and, you know, if you get a really clear response like that, it really narrows from an IT perspective what you need to apply high availability to and, and where you can kind of, you know, exert effort. And then if everything's down, you now have a very clear priority list without having to, in the middle of a crisis, be talking to people to try to establish a priority list. You have one that you're working from already. So in the event that everything's down, First, bring up the financial system, then bring up the email, then bring up the phone system, then bring up that's the order in which you're working on restoring services if, if in an everything down situation. Having inventories is obviously going to be very helpful, knowing what you have, knowing where it is, uh, having an understanding of what's online. A, a thing that I found very helpful are checklists of you know, to figure out the top 10 or 15 things that are working. So anytime I have a large complex environment and we have to let's say restart it, or there's a power outage to the building, which happens sometimes, or there's, you know, a power outage to the neighborhood, we have a little checklist of things that we run through to test the different systems to make sure that everything is back online in the way we expect it. So we don't find out three days later, oh, this one system re rebooted and it really didn't come back online the way we expected. This website isn't working or this application isn't working. So a little checklist can be hugely helpful here to make sure when you power everything back up, you know, you just run through the checklist. Matching the equipment to those functions, pretty basic stuff. Just helps you prioritize what to fix, what to get back online. So obviously, you know, internet, that's an important thing. Power <laughs> comes first then maybe internet, then you power up the phone system, then other things. So understanding your sequencing of systems and what comes online first, that, that will help. I'm sorry, I have to, I've, I've made it all the way this far without having to minimize my window. So think about processes. If you don't have, um, you know, everything, how can you get the job done? And are there other ways that you can accomplish different tasks 
if you don't have the particular tool. So again, if, you're, if your office is shut down because of power and you're primarily on cloud-based systems, then again, your, your staff can ostensibly work from any location and work off their personal computers and still be highly functional, potentially. Same thing if you're on cloud-based voice systems, if you're using something like Dialpad or Ring Central or 8x8 or something like that, you know, even the phone system can remain fully functional in an offline. People can still use the regular numbers, you can still receive the regular numbers. Um, but think about different ways you can do stuff. Uh, a big thing that I see organizations struggle with are the outbound greetings and website notifications in the event of crises. So if you have something that takes your office offline, and a lot of people call your organization, then often no one's quite sure how to change the inbound voicemail to say, oh, we're offline and please call this number. People aren't sure how to reroute the number if it can't pick up. Again, this is so much easier if you're on cloud-based voice systems, but making sure that you have documented all the processes and know how to do those things ahead of time so you're not trying to figure it out on the fly. This is that high availability option. So if there's something, if when you run through these scenarios, if you discover something that you really can't be, that can't be offline for five minutes or 10 minutes or a day or two days, then thinking about replicating it and making sure that you have that available somewhere else. And then getting into the cybersecurity attacks, and we'll take a little bit of time on this, because it's something people talked about. With, with cloud systems, there's wonderful notification tools that you can set up for Google Apps or G Suite Now, Office 365, Salesforce, Dropbox, et cetera, that can help you know if, for example, uh, Brian, I'll just use this example again. Let's say Brian's on Roundtable's Google App system and suddenly his account logs in from Uganda. And that's not something that he has done before. I'll, I'll get a notification that'll say, hey, this account just logged in from Uganda. And, I can look at that, and if I don't know for a fact that Brian's in Uganda or remoting to some system in Uganda that he might be checking his Gmail account from, then I can reach out to Brian and say, hey, Brian, this, this happened. Does this make any sense to you? If he says no, then we can say, okay, we've had a breach. We have a breach of Brian's account. Let's go change his password. Let's go review what information was there, and we, we've got an immediate notification, and we can start to think about containing that. In terms of malware, you know, obviously if you get ransomware, there's, there's a pretty set, set of things to do. For an additional resource, uh, as part of the Ninja series that, that Brian helped me out with, uh, the privacy section of the, the ninth class for that, you can reach these at ninja.rtt.nyc. Uh, Brian, I don't want to start browsing right now, but if you want to go grab the URL for that. The ninth one we did was incident response. And there's a guide put out by Digital Guardian which is the Incident Responders Field Guide, which is was was released in March of this year and is the best thing that I've seen on this topic in terms of being really readable, really understandable, really clear about the process to go through and, and how to contain, you know, understand that you've had a breach, contain the breach, meaning let's let's make sure it's not getting worse. Then let's figure out what, you know, to the best we can, what happened, what we're gonna do about it, and start to communicate externally. And, and do all these things. And so that, for ideal where they reviewed that here, I encourage everybody, it's a half an hour webinar if you want to go watch that. Uh, but at the very least, you can download that Digital Guardian uh, Incident Responders Field Guide, which is very good around these kinds of things. And if you aren't, if you're using these cloud systems for breach notification, I really encourage you who either can talk to your IT admins or who are IT admins, to really explore all the different alert notifications you can set up in these cloud systems. I don't want to get too deep into this topic now, and Brian, you can let me know if, if we want to explore this, or folks, you can, you can put questions in the chat if you want to explore this deeper, but one of the real challenges around uh, cybersecurity is actually knowing that something's happened, that you've been breached. And historically, this has been something that's been kind of limited to organizations that have a lot of resources because you need all these logs, you need to review firewall logs, you need to review system logs, you need, you need either an application that looks at those logs and breaks down different reports, or you need you know, cybersecurity personnel who actually know what all these things mean. And even with those resources, you have 
a tremendous signal to noise ratio problem because if I go review a typical firewall log, there might be a thousand intrusion detection you know notifications within the firewall log. That's just norm a normal day on a normal network that you know there's all these botnets and everything that are just constantly poking and prodding at any public IP address that's out there. And learning so when I say a signal noise problem, I mean if I set up alerts for these systems, I'll be getting a thousand alerts a day or ten thousand alerts a day and it becomes meaningless and it becomes very, very difficult to to parse any meaningful information from that. But what the cloud providers uh, ha have done over the past year and are continuing to do is allowed you to really kind of tweak and set notifications for different kinds of events that are actually meaningful and actually don't bury you in alerts that aren't helpful to you. And spending some time to start setting up those alerts and monitoring them can be huge in helping you understand that something bad has potentially happened. Brian, is there yeah, anything you want to throw in on that? Um, I dropped a link into the chat for the Digital Guardian um, incident response um, okay. webpage there. Definitely worth checking out. Um, I'll drop a link to the Cybersecurity Ninja series here in a minute into the chat also. Thanks. And the main one that, that I just, in, in terms of this, is the ninth session, which is on incident response and was based purely on that on that guide. So looking at that guide will give you a lot of that. But if you want broader cybersecurity stuff, there's a lot of stuff there. And Brian, thank you for your help with that. What about paper? Thinking about that, if you have digital copies of stuff, you know, that's obviously better. There's all sorts of ways to convert a lot of paper stuff to digital. If you have a need to do that, if you don't need the paper, get rid of it, have it shredded. Um, if you do need to keep stuff, really consider having it converted to digital. If it's really important, you know, you can warehouse it, you can do other things, but if it's just sitting in your office and filing cabinets and it's actually critical information to have and you don't have digital copies of it, then it's just like any other thing if we go through that scenario, right? If, if you have a fire, if you have a flood, if you have something like that, that information is potentially all gone with no ability to recover it. And that would be a bummer. All right, into the chat. So for you folks, I'm curious as to what your quick thoughts are. What's, if, if you had an outage, let's say we just took all of your systems offline for the moment and, and it was gonna take you, let's, to, to do this as a kind of clear thought exercise, let's, let's run it like this. If I took every, every piece of your organization offline and said it's gonna take you two hours per thing, so it, to restore email, it'll take you two hours. To restore file sharing, two hours to restore your phones, two hours, to restore your you know, CRM application, two hours. What's the first thing that you would wanna recover for your organization? I'm wondering if that's clear for folks or if they're you know, kind of taking a guess. I'm just curious as to what people would put in. So I've got one vote for email. Email would be the first thing that they would come back. Let's see if other votes come in here. Um, and while people are um, responding, the URL ninja.rtt.nyc has links to all of the past sessions. Um, so all 10 of them are there, including the incident response, which is number nine. Um, wonderful sessions. They're each uh, rather short, compact, a lot of information in them. From a security perspective, I strongly recommend running through these. Uh, we're going to do a blog post for LSN tab um, highlighting these at some point in the near future also. Yeah, and there, there, there's no need to watch all of them, just to be clear. They, it was designed as a series of 10, but, but it's absolutely, you can just go pick, oh, that's the topic I'm interested in and go look at it. So thanks, Brian. All right, so we've got mostly email. People are mostly concerned about email, and that seems to be the number one thing. We've got another person saying FileMaker databases, and so that's an interesting thing because that's probably running on a server somewhere, and then you need to think about that, you know, if that server got wiped out in a flood or the hardware failed or, you know, things like that, then, you know, how would we recover those things? Uh, another thing, and I don't think this is covered in the session, is to understand the concepts of, of different levels of downtime. For cloud systems, just so everybody understands, there's this 
concepts of five nines and you can do a Wikipedia page on it. And I'll, I'll use the numbers that I have in my head. These might be slightly off, but they're roughly accurate. You have five nines is the kind of gold standard industry for uptime. And what, what five nines means is that a system that has five nines uptime is 99.999% available, meaning there won't be unscheduled downtime. And that's, that means there's, I believe, less than five minutes per year of unscheduled downtime for a system that has five nines availability. That, that's about as good as you're going to get. Pretty much all of the cloud systems that, that most of us would use, Office 365, G Suite, Dropbox, Box, Salesforce, et cetera, run three nines, 99.9%. And what that translates to is roughly eight hours of unscheduled downtime per year. This doesn't sound too bad, and for most of us is not too bad. However, it is important to understand that that is unplanned. And if there is a particular time of year where not having access to your email, even if it's on Gmail, would be like an existential level threat to your organization, like it would be catastrophic, then you may need to look into either paying, you know, some of the providers are starting to offer five nines availability as a tier of service that you can buy your, buy your way into and then they, they have you on a different platform. Um, or you may have to go to a provider that can actually guarantee five nines. This is a bit minutia, but I do think it's important for folks to understand that while cloud services are likely to be much more available than anything you're going to be running out of your own data center, they still are not 100% uptime systems. They still do have downtime. And in, in my experience with, with most of these, it's usually not complete downtime. It's usually the service is degraded. So Google Drive will be kind of wonky, for lack of a better word, for a couple of hours on a Wednesday afternoon randomly. And Outlook Web Access will be wonky, for lack of a better term, for a couple of hours. or there can be major internet disruptions. I don't know how many people were around for the Dyne DNS, uh, which happened, I want to say, about six months or eight months ago, where a major uh, DNS service got DDoSed and, and basically taken offline. And that resulted in huge swaths of the internet kind of not functioning well. So a lot of people kind of basically couldn't get to their websites or couldn't get to Gmail or, or other online services. And there's lots of other things that can happen. Amazon's S3 service uh, runs way more of the internet than virtually anybody knows. And if that has an outage, then a lot of things are down. So it is important to understand these cloud services can be disrupted. And if you have like no backup plan for that, that's, that's probably not a great situation, especially if your email, as you're saying, that's a really business critical service. All right, so into our case study, Her Justice. Sandy was on the, on the way. We talked about this. Mary O'Shaughnessy is someone that I've worked with regularly, uh, quickly made a, a plan. Uh, by the way, executive director is the wrong title for her. She's director of IT. Uh, made a plan a couple of days before the storm struck. And I remember because I was on the phone with her at that time. And we decided that the best thing to do was that it was very likely that they were going to lose power. Uh, and even though they were many, many floors up, but it was clear that their building was going to shut down. And they had a number of internal servers, virtual servers, all these other things. And we decided that it would be best to preemptively shut those systems down. This happens in a lot of systems. New York City subway system does this as well. If they know a big storm is coming, their recovery time is you know, exponentially better if they preemptively shut down the system and pull the trains out and turn off all the electricity. So if, if there's electricity and trains in a tunnel that floods, then all of a sudden they've got all these switches and all this electrical stuff and these stranded trains and it takes them days or weeks or months to get all this stuff out. But what they've learned over many, many years is if they know the flood is coming and they clear out the tunnel and they turn off all the power to it ahead of time, then all they have to do is wait for the water to recede and then turn everything back on and everything's basically fine. And that, that was actually how they did things with Sandy and they, they were back almost to full functional on the subway system very quickly. So she did that and it flooded and they closed the office for a week. So they were, I think they weren't allowed in their office for three days. They decided to close it for the whole week. And when they came back, uh, everything 
power back on and everything was fine, you know, which is fortunate. They, they were one of the more fortunate where their power wasn't out for a longer period of time. Their internet wasn't out for a longer period of time. And because they preempt, they didn't have, you know, a unplanned shutdown of their systems. There was no problems with bringing everything back up. Everything was fine. However, they, at that time, because they had to shut everything down, their email and their document management was all on those surveyors. And so everybody was just communicating over personal emails during that week of outage time, and they didn't have access to a lot of their organizational files. And they, there's something they accepted, and they knew that was going to be the case. But they said, okay, if this happens again, we'd really rather be much more functional. And that was, as I referenced before, the impetus to migrate to cloud. So they, they migrated to Office 365 and SharePoint and OneDrive for a lot of their stuff. And that's, you know, a, a really common thing. Uh, sorry, so getting back online. Uh, if your hardware was damaged, how are you replace it? How long is it going to take? Is your insurance going to cover it? You know, do you have a plan for getting it? So just, just having basic questions like that, I would say the insurance thing is a, is a big question. Thinking about where your data is, the thought exercises that we ran through in the early part of it, the first one of removing all the technology from your office and replacing with brand new stuff, uh, and then the, the second one of just turning off the power for a couple of days, that that helps you. Those two uh, little scenarios really will help you understand where your data is. Because if you really go through those and with your IT person who knows where all the stuff is, you'll know what data gets lost when you remove all the technology, and you'll know what systems are unavailable when your stuff is down. And so that's important to to understand going in. Really basic backups, know how to do recoveries, do recoveries regularly, review your backup selections. Most common things I see with backups are obviously people not having tested and it turns out the backups aren't good, but I would say that the most common uh, backup fail that I see is backups, uh, the, the critical data not having been selected to be backed up in the first place. Easy scenario to give you, organization has a backup system, everything's great, they use QuickBooks. They decide to migrate to FundyZ. They had QuickBooks on a server, and the backup was pointing to the QuickBooks folder, was backing up all the QuickBooks company files, the backups of the company files got ran to another folder, the backups grabbed those, everything's hunky-dory, and then they migrate to FundyZ, and FundyZ is running in a different folder on a different server, and no one updates the backup to start backing up FundyZ and two years go by and the backup reports are saying 100%, everything backed up every day, everything's great. And then they have a failure of the FundyZ server and they say, oh great, let's go restore those FundyZ backups. And then the heart palpitations start as the person realizes, as they look through the backup logs to find the FundyZ stuff that it's not there because it never got selected to be backed up in the first place. That is a mistake I see way too frequently uh, in the world. And I, again, an annual review of your backup selections and just looking at, you know, what's changed and then also having IT processes that make sure that part of installing a new system is thinking about how that system is going to be backed up. All really good things. How confident are you that your nonprofit could restore a backup within a few hours? So if you are the IT person, and your executive director came to you and said, hey, I need this file from yesterday. Can you please restore it? You're talking five minutes, you're talking 10 minutes, you're talking, you're getting down your knees and praying. If you're the executive director, you're not the IT person, what's your level of confidence if you go to the IT person that they would be able to pull that file? So we're seeing a lot of A's here. I'm seeing only A's so far, this is great. So people are uh, very confident in their backups, that's great. Glad to see that. Not a ton of responses here, but those who came in, all A's. Still all A's coming in. Excellent. 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 People have good backup systems in place. Very happy to hear that. Other planning considerations, and we're, we're home stretch now. Workday versus weekday. How will your response be different if people are in the office versus at home? If you're a distributed workforce like a dealware roundtable, this is Super easy question, it's kind of the same <laughs> all the time, but uh, that's some, something just to think about real quickly uh, for your organization. And so you work through it, you know, think about training and practice. Again, I, I don't encourage organizations to run, again, unless you 
really, unless you're like a four or five on that, you know, your services really need to run in the event of an emergency. I don't necessarily recommend running actual fire drills of your entire disaster response plan. But again, actual rigorous, scenario planning, you know, actually just talk it through, think it through with the key players, what would happen, ABC is absolutely worth it for every type of organization from the, you know, the domestic violence shelter all the way to the community theater. Looking at your insurance again, just like with vendors, it's not the time to figure out, you don't know who your internet vendor is. Again, you know, right after you had a flood is not the best time to find out that your insurance doesn't cover floods or doesn't cover water damage from fires or ridiculous things like that. Cybersecurity insurance, I get asked about a lot, certainly worth looking into for your organization, but a lot of times it's redundant with other coverage you already have uh, or with coverage you already have from your outsourced IT provider. So for example, a lot of people have fixed rate managed support with Roundtable and then they are going to pay for cybersecurity that's going to cover the labor for someone to help them recover from like a ransomware attack or something like that. And we explained to them, well, your labor is covered because you're already paying us the fixed rate for whatever support. So if you had a ransomware attack, we're gonna do all of our labor is already covered under that, you know, as long as you have that contract with us. On the other hand, if they were paying hourly, then we would say, yes, you might want to consider that cybersecurity assurance because if you needed 20 hours of us unexpectedly, that could be a, a big bill that you wouldn't be anticipating. So understanding where you're already covered and, and where you're not is, is a good, Good thing to go through. Having it written down, putting it on paper, putting it in a document, there's all kinds of good templates for this. And Idealware is going to be, I believe, releasing a uh, article on this that will have some templates in it in a couple of weeks. So you can be on the lookout for that. Again, if it's on the server that's unavailable, that's not gonna help. Most people don't make this mistake, but it's a, it's a reasonable thing. I'll give you guys a quick tip of something that, that I've done, which is a lot of times like administrative passwords to certain critical services become a stumbling block if you know your IT director isn't available or something like that. I would, on an annual basis, we had two executives that were sort of the backups for IT, and we had a set of about five credentials, like our Windows Active Directory, uh, domain admin, um, the administrative credentials for our website, a couple other things just that would allow people, you know, allow them if, if I was completely gone or unavailable and my IT colleagues were unavailable and they really needed to hire somebody and needed to be able to give them access to the systems. It was those key credentials that would get them into stuff. I would put those on a business card and I would give it to them once a year and I would tell them to keep that where they keep their credit cards and their other things. And you know, that was that that way, if their wallet or business got stolen, they could tell me that. And I would have all of those things and know which credentials I needed to then go change quickly. And then once a year, I would just update all those, ask them for the old business card, shred it, give them a new one. Really easy, took 15 minutes a year. And then they had those if in the event that something happened. So it was like a really easy solution. I forget where I found that, but I, I thought that was a smart thing. In review, um, oh, and by the way, the point I was going to make, I forgot about that. If you if you put your whole disaster thing as a cloud document, if you put it up in OneDrive or Dropbox or something like that, uh, this is not something that usually, if it doesn't itself have any credentials in it, it's not something that needs to be super highly secure. And, you know, I'm not saying publish it where, you know, Google's going to find it, but you can certainly put it in a document where all you need is a link. And then you can create a short URL for it. And then you can put that on that little business card. So now your executives and all the people in the plan actually have a business card that has uh, the credentials for key systems if they need those and a link to the disaster plan that if they can get to any machine with internet access, they can type that URL in and there's the disaster plan. That's pretty cool. And that's just on a paper business card. Again, really easy to do. In review, don't be afraid to imagine these bad scenarios. Don't don't get you know bummed out or anything. It's just you know <laughs> these things are going to happen, right? They have happened historically. They will happen again. Hopefully, they're not going to happen to any of us, but they do happen. And the better prepared you are for it, uh, the better you're going to be able to serve your constituents and your staff, and the less stressed you're going to be uh, in that moment. All right, review all of your systems. Make sure everybody understands safety first. Um, and write it all out. 
and with that, I think we are we are in wrap up. Just a couple more links. There's some links here for you for uh, emergency preparedness, for workplace plans. There's some templates there uh, that you can get. Sorry that that kind of came out formatted a little bit strangely. And with that, uh, we'll do QRA and don't forget to fill out our survey and there's no link there. All right. <laughs> Uh, Brian, do you have a survey that you're going to send people to? Otherwise, we'll. Uh... Uh, yeah, since we moved to go to webinar, the survey um, will, uh, as you close down, it will pop up, and then we'll also email it to people within 24 hours um, through the system. So, okay. definitely. And we finished 10 minutes early, so we got time for Q and A. I'm going to go through and to see. It looks like all the, the things I'm seeing are answered to questions so far, but I'm just going to delete all these out in case new questions come in. If anyone has a question, by all means, just uh, chime in. If you have a comment or any tip on disaster planning that, that you want to share. Um, oh, someone's playing with the mouse cursor on screen. I'm sorry. I, I was not getting it out there. Uh, it's a Security Ninja webinar coming again since it is over. Uh, we're not planning to rerun it as a live series, but as Brian mentioned, for the Ninja webinars, uh, all of the recordings of every single webinar we did, including Brian's, which was session five or six, I forget which one it was, which was on digital privacy. Uh, all of those are available for free. All of the slide decks are available for free. And you can get all of those at ninja.rtt.nyc. And then answer that question. Apologies for the cursor sitting on the screen. When I was leaving that, I wasn't paying attention. I, I, I like pace around the room, so I just look at the slide very briefly. I apologize if that was driving people nuts. Uh, a question from Kelly, we contract out our IT support. Is it reasonable uh, to ask them to, or expect them to do a test backup occasionally? The short answer to that, Kelly, is 100% yes. Uh, the longer answer is if you have a fixed rate plan with them, if you're paying some fixed amount per month for a set of services, then honestly, you would need to review your contract to see if, uh, tests of the backup system are included in that or not and you know you could ask what they would charge to do that on a you know some basis uh, if you pay them by the hour then they're not going to be doing that on their own because they'll make the assumption I, you know that you won't want to pay for that so you'll have to be proactive about saying we'd like to pay you to test our backups what would you charge us to you know do some random restores and and verify that our backups are working. But in most managed service contracts, tests of backups are included. In roundtables, it is included. Uh, depending on the service level, we either do it monthly or quarterly for different organizations. And we actually do go ahead and restore files. And some of the newer systems, we use a, a high availability system called Datto. And Datto now actually does its own self-restores every day which is really cool. So data is a system where it creates like these virtual instances of the systems you're backing up. And so it literally just within its own environment, it mounts the virtual system and restores a file from the previous day and then set, tells you, sends you a notification saying, we did this and it was successful, which is super cool. And and from a cost perspective, I'd highly recommend that when you go to renew contracts with particular vendors, you talk to them about adding um, that type of testing as part of it, because then they have the motivation to keep you as a contract at that point, and it's much easier to add it in then. Yep. And I would say from touching on the cybersecurity piece, I would also, Kelly, if you're going to have a conversation about them, there's a, a whole set of, of things that optimally would be covered under a service contract. And, and I would also, you know, every month we're doing test backups for organizations. We're patching all of their systems, firewalls, desktops, servers, everything with, with current uh, firmware or software. And that would include third-party applications like Adobe and Java and things like that, and then also testing the credentials that we have for their systems to verify that they work so that we know we can log into their GoDaddy account, to their Active Directory and things like that. And that's a, you know, I would consider to be a sort of best practice for any managed service provider to, to be doing those things. All right, any other questions? I think we're good.
All right, Brian, I'm happy to stick around for five minutes, but it looks like we're clear of questions. And Excellent. Thank you. Up, so, yeah. uh, thank you so much for coming out and talking to us today. We greatly appreciate it.